Welcome to our virtual field trip, Watershed Wonders Part 2. My name is Kelsey, children's educator here at Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden. I am away from my coworkers and I am going to take off my mask because it's safe to do so, so you can hear me and see me a little bit better for our video today. Thank you for joining us for Part 2 of Watershed Wonders. In part one, we learned about watersheds. And we learned how water moves through a watershed and can carry pollution with it. In part two, we're going to be discussing one of a watershed's most important features, a wetland. Bogs, fins, marshes, and swamps are other names for wetlands. And they're characterized by their location, and the type of plants in them and how water moves through them. Today we'll be talking about the functions of a wetland. We'll talk about some plants and animals that call the wetland their home. And we'll also do some water tests and talk about ways to tell if the water is healthy or not. Right now we're sitting at the edge of a stream that's flowing from higher elevation to lower elevation because of gravity. And while that water passes over the land, it carries things with it. Erosion is the process which soil, sand, and bits of rock are moved. And so this water is eroding the land as it moves over it and it's also carrying with it pollution and sediment. We'll talk about what sediment is in just a second and we'll also talk about what happens to that water once it enters a wetland from a stream. So our streams move water and sediment down into the wetland where that water is slowed down. Sediment is anything that is solid floating in the water like soil, sand, silt, bits of leaves. And as you can see here, I have a water sample with some sediment. And so I'm gonna shake it up as if it is moving through the stream. So as I shake it up, the sediment is moved. And then I'll slow it down the way that the water is in the wetland. As the water slows down, you can see that the sediment is starting to settle down to the bottom. As that sediment settles, it clings to pollution and brings the pollution down and buries it underneath layers of sediment. Also, the plants around the edge of the wetland help to act as a physical barrier for pollution getting into the water. Fertilizer is also another type of pollution that uh, we learned about in part one of the watershed story. And the plants around the edge, like these cattails and this button bush, can absorb the fertilizer and incorporate it into the parts of the plant or the plant's biomass to keep it out of the water. We will talk about how to tell if there's too much fertilizer in the water and some tests that we do to test for fertilizers in the water. So another thing that wetlands do when they slow down the water is they help to store it underground. Groundwater is an important resource and it is stored under in the earth's crust and it feeds aquifers. Aquifers are pools under the earth's crust that we can tap into to get fresh water that we drink. Lots of people drink water out of wells or freshwater springs and Wetlands help to recharge or to add water back into the groundwater, but they also help to filter that water as it's added back. So we can pretend like the jar at the bottom is our aquifer, and we can pretend like this filter is the wetland. So as I, I'm gonna add 
this water to my wetland filter. Oops. And we can see how it's filtering out the sediment and pollution. And the water in our aquifer is clear and hopefully cleaner. Let's do some tests to see if our water is healthy. At uh, Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden, we test the water every month to make sure that we are not polluting. The first test that we're going to do is the temperature, take the temperature of the water. It's important to have temperature data and data is uh, recording the measurements or our observations that we find. And it's important to have data of temperature of the water and the air to be able to track environmental changes over time. So I've got my water thermometer in this water body right here. And so I'm going to pull it out and we'll take the temperature together. Okay, so on the right side of our thermometer, there's an F. Does anybody know what F stands for? You said Fahrenheit, you're correct. So on the right, we're reading the degrees Fahrenheit and on the left, there's a C. And the C stands for Celsius. And we will practice reading both of those uh, today. So on the right side, we can see that the number that the line stops closest to is 90. That means our water is 90 degrees Fahrenheit today. Phew, when we say the temperature, we always have to have the three parts, 90, the number, degrees, and Fahrenheit. On the left side of our thermometer, our blue line goes all the way up to the line just above 30. On our Celsius side of the thermometer, each line counts for two degrees. So our temperature in Celsius is 32 degrees Celsius. The next test that we'll do is called turbidity. Turbidity is how clear the water is. So I've got three water samples to show the difference between low turbidity levels, which is clear, and high turbidity levels, which is very murky or muddy. Before we do our test, I'm gonna ask you a question, and that is, is the water here clear? And I would like for you to make a hypothesis or a guess whether or not you think that the water here is clear. So, let's take a look and make a guess or a hypothesis. Don't say it out loud, just keep it in your head. And we can do our test, our turbidity test using this turbidity tube. This turbidity tube has a ruler on the side of it that is 120 centimeters. So when we test the turbidity, we'll be measuring it in centimeters. So I've got my tube. I also took a water sample in this bucket right here. And I'm gonna add my sample to the tube. Okay, oops, a little bit more. And then I can view the disc at the bottom of the tube called a Secchi disc. I can view that from the top. And if I can see the disc, I can see it. So that means that the turbidity is at least 120 centimeters. So, if you look at it, I would say that that is pretty clear. Is that different from your hypothesis? Hmm. 
So we tested the temperature of the water and we also tested the turbidity or how clear the water is. We can also make observations about a water body to see if it's healthy. One observation we can make is by smell. Does the water smell natural or does it smell sulfury or like there's a chemical present? We can also look at the water and see if it is a strange or unnatural color. We can also look for the presence of algae. So algae is an aquatic plant. You can see we have some growing in our pond behind us. It grows on the rocks and animals like to eat algae. But sometimes if there's too much algae, it can cause a problem. So an algae bloom is when fertilizers get into the water body and fertilize the algae, causing it to grow out of control. And the ways that fertilizers get into the water body is if we are over fertilizing our lawns or gardens or farms, and then the rain washes it into the water body, it can cause an algae bloom. The main chemical components of fertilizers are uh, usually nitrates and phosphates. And so sometimes at the garden, we test for nitrates and phosphates in the water just to make sure that we're not over fertilizing or that we're fertilizing appropriately in the garden. I have this low cost water monitoring kit and you can purchase this kit made by Lamont to use at school or at home. Of course, if you are testing water, make sure to take precautions if that water looks or is polluted. This is a really good way that you can test water at school or at home yourself. So I mentioned cattails and our button bush earlier in this video. And now I wanna take time to show you guys a plant uh, that grows in the wetland that gets its food in a very unique way. These pitcher plants behind me get their name because they're shaped like a tube, like a pitcher. And in that pitcher, they are catching bugs. So our pitcher plant has a sweet smelling nectar or juice in the bottom of the pitcher and it attracts insects to fly in and once they're trapped in there the bug or the plant starts to digest them and use the insect as its food so this plant is a carnivorous or insectivorous plant and i cut one open so that you could see some of the bugs that have been unlucky to go inside the pitcher plant. So you can see all of that goop is insects that are becoming digested by our pitcher plants. Yuck. So our pitcher plant has a unique adaptation for getting its food. And adaptation is a word that means to change over time. So, we can see many different adaptations in the wetland. Because this environment is so unique, there are many plants and animals that have adapted or changed over time to be able to call the wetland their home. One of those animals is a dragonfly. Dragonflies begin their life cycle as an egg that was laid on a plant near the edge of the water. That egg drops into the water and hatches out as a nymph. I have a nymph right here. And the nymph of the dragonfly spends its life in the mud, catching smaller critters to eat. And then as the nymph gets bigger and bigger, it begins to crawl up the side onto a rock or to a plant, and then out hatches the adult dragonfly, which begins its life in the air and on land. So another animal that begins its life cycle in the water, can you think of an animal that begins in the water and swims and then grows legs and hops onto the land? 
you said frog or toad, you're exactly right. So the wetland is also a home for tadpoles and frogs that have a interesting life cycle like our dragonfly. So we talked about how wetlands can help to filter the groundwater. And we also talked about how the wetland slows down water from streams so that sediment and pollution can settle to the bottom. Wetlands can also act like a sponge. The soil and the plants in a wetland absorb water and hold it like a sponge, which helps in times of drought or little or no rain because that water is held or stored. Also, the wetland can help in times of flood because when it rains a lot, the sponge soaks up that water and keeps it from doing damage. I'm sitting next to a wetland tree. Uh, this is called a bald cypress tree, and bald cypresses have a special adaptation that allow them to live in very wet soil or even sometimes in the water. These are the bald cypress knees, and they're called cypress knees because if you bend your knee, they're knobby, like our knees. And the knees help the tree to balance in a very wet soil or even in the water. And they also help to get the tree oxygen. Thank you for joining our virtual field trip, Watershed Wonders, part two. Today, we learned about the function of a wetland. We learned about some animals and plants that live in a wetland habitat. And we also did some simple water tests and learned about indicators of good water health. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.